Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm Zach Hancock, the evolutionary biologist whose goal in life is to get as many people to understand and like population genetics as humanly possible. This channel is largely dedicated to this goal with the occasional history and philosophy of science, and sometimes we use what we've learned in population genetics to debunk silly young earth creationist claims. Before jumping into today's video, I want to plug the project I've been working on since early May that I'm tentatively calling Demystifying Evolution. This project is a 100% open access project that will be walking you, dear viewer, through the entire scientific epic of a research program in evolution. Ever wondered how we plan projects? What the typical evolutionary biologist does? Wanted to peer behind the black box of a molecular research lab and see how genomes are sequenced and assembled? If you answered yes to any of these, then this project is for you. It will be a full-length documentary complete with all the ups and downs of being a scientist in the 21st century. Along the way, I also interview some other familiar faces that many of you will recognize. If you want to learn more, check out the video link in the description below. Without further ado, let's get started. In the fall of 2005, the tiny, unaccredited Aleem Bible College in western New York published a strange little book by retired Cornell plant geneticist John Sanford called Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome. On the book's cover was a UFO hovering above a library. Though this bizarre design choice was replaced in later editions by the hands from Michelangelo's Creation of Man, the book's author spent most of his career breeding plants with a particular eye to developing techniques to genetic engineer crop varieties. He is credited as the co-inventor of the Gene Gun, a device that propels metal projectiles coated with specific DNA into a cell's nucleus. He's written dozens of papers on the topic, mostly in plant biotech journals. In 1997, he founded the Feed My Sheep Foundation, a creationist think tank that seemed in the early years devoted to promoting creationism, but has now kind of pivoted to outright moral panic at what they refer to as the sexual holocaust. You know the story, the typical pearl clutching about the kids t learning sex ed in public schools and bemoaning gender ideology. Uh, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Sanford retired from Cornell a year after founding FMS and has basically devoted all of his time and effort since to promoting creationism. And what a year 2005 was for creationism. Early that spring, the Discovery Institute, also a think tank for intelligent design was involved in the infamous Kansas Board of Education meetings. The board was pushing the Discovery Institute's talking points onto students. One board member, Kathy Martin, proclaimed at the meeting, quote, evolution has been proven false. ID is science-based and strong in facts. Sanford himself served as an expert witness on behalf of the board. While on the stand, he admitted to believing that the world was less than 10,000 years old and that, quote, we were created by a special creation by God. He stated that he was in the process of, quote, writing books and testified that the genome is degrading via near-neutral mutations like rust on your car. This idea is the central concept in Genetic Entropy, published later that fall. Sanford claims that the genomes of all organisms are degrading due to the accumulation of deleterious mutations. To him and other creationists, this puts a clock on all life. Living things can't be billions of years old if mutations can only degrade function and never construct it. 
This book has gone through a few editions, um, the most recent being in 2014, and new editions are now published exclusively through Sanford's own foundation. The book is only 230 pages, including figures and references, and is written in this large text in 1.5 spaced with block paragraphs instead of the normal indentation. It has 10 formal chapters that conclude by page 145. The rest make up the appendices, which serve as a collection of quote mines, an attempt to calculate the efficiency of selection in the only quantitative portion of the book, and then some responses to critics. We should begin by asking the simple question, who did Sanford write this book for? As a Cornell geneticist, one can only conclude that this book could have been directed at professional scientists and followed the form of the technical literature. I have many such books on my shelf. Here's one from the population geneticist Michael Lynch in 2007, The Origins of Genome Architecture. This book was written for biologists. While these sort of books tend to have limited readership, they do undergo rigorous peer review. Lynch lists 22 people, all population geneticists, who reviewed this book and provided comments and feedback. That is, his book was critiqued at every stage of development by his peers to ensure accuracy. Sanford could have taken this route. Many biologists write books that don't meet this level of technicality, though. Richard Dawkins and Stephen Jay Gould are both famous for writing books that can be digested by a lay audience. Even these assume some basic science understanding and challenge the reader to keep up, if you will. They are books meant to teach you something, to elevate your understanding. And while they are not as extensively reviewed before being published, they are reviewed afterwards. Many popular science books are reviewed in legit scientific journals, which often publish book reviews. Again, while not as rigorous a layperson could, in theory, seek out these reviews and get some idea of the quality of the science presented. This is not the route Sanford took, either. Sanford's audience is quite narrow. He is writing specifically to creationists. And not only to creationists, but to creationists who have so little background in biology that he almost entirely avoids talking biology. Everything is written in analogy. Car rust, spaceships, little wagons, library books, the princess and the pea, and on and on. As a geneticist, I found this made for an exceptionally tedious read. And since his audience is so narrow, and not to mention published by an unaccredited Bible college, it guaranteed that no scientist would ever see it, much less be interested in writing a review of it. I can't stress this enough. This book was not reviewed by any experts. Michael Behe, a biochemist, comes the closest to a competent reviewer, but the central claim of this book is not one of biochemistry. The primary claim of this book, and what reveals its villains, is a claim about population genetics. All of his citations are population genetics, and it is these who receive the bulk of his ire. Perhaps this alone shied him away from requesting a single population geneticist give it a read, but more likely is he simply doesn't care what they think. Now, Sanford does occasionally drop science-y sounding words like nucleosome binding sites and isochores, little italicized notes about disagreements whether distribution should be gamma or exponentially distributed. But these appear suddenly with no explanation and never show up again. Uh, one can't help but feel like Sanford kind of seasoned the text with these little terms to make the reader go, wow, big word, big brain, instead of actually trying to educate the reader. And this is because Sanford is not interested in the truth in this book. This is a Christian apologetics book. It is meant to solidify the faith of the believer. Nothing in this text will be convincing to the non-believer, and much less so to scientists, especially population geneticists who are intimately familiar with these topics. 
The writing style manages to be both bland and hyperbolic at the same time. Even when he's denigrating population geneticists, he claims that they intimidated other biologists with their fancy math, one still can't help but yawn from boredom. Nothing about his style grabs you or imparts the slightest hint that the writer is an interesting human, or a well-read one, or a particularly clever one. The composition conjures images of chick tracks, those little comic booklets that make the short declarative statements with over-reliance on qualifiers like very. There are lots of rhetorical questions and long paragraphs with overly detailed analogies that one can easily get lost in what the original point about biology was supposed to even be. He has this one about how the genome is like an instruction manual for building a wagon, which, like, fine. But then he goes on to say, but it's really like an instruction manual for building each of the wagon's component parts before they arrive in the box, and for gathering the raw materials and smelting the metal, mixing the paint, etc. What exactly does this add to the initial analogy? He rambles on that actually, actually, it's more like building a jet engine, or hear me out, like a spaceship. But wait, no, the real genome is infinitely more complex than even that. Sanford is just cosplaying William Paley stumbling upon a watch in a grove. The core reason evolutionary biology has been so successful is that it can explain the emergence of complexity and design using only natural forces. The first chapter opens with a newsflash, a corny subheading gift bestowed on all subsequent chapters that proclaims, quote, the genome is an instruction manual. I've noticed that creationists struggle with the concept of analogy. You see, it should read the genome is like an instruction manual. And only is it like a manual in the most simplistic of senses. The core component of the genome is DNA, which is, of course, a molecule. Specifically, it's a nucleic acid composed of a ribose sugar covalently bonded to a phosphate molecule and a nitrogenous base. The bases come in many varieties. The canonical ones are adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. There are other nucleotide-like molecules that can replace these. For example, one form of oxidized guanine called 8-prime oxo-DG results from oxidative stress and is key in many redox forms of gene regulation. These bases themselves can also bind to each other to form dimers. A famous example is the thymine-thymine dimer, which results in a bulge in the DNA backbone. The DNA is further modified by proteins. These are long peptides that form three-dimensional structures due to each amino acid's affinity to neighboring ones. That is, the folding is purely biochemical. Some folds have to be helped by other enzymes, called chaperones, that direct certain folding patterns. Despite these proteins being specified from the same underlying sequence of nucleotides, no two are exactly alike. This is because the transcription and translational process is highly error-prone, leading to as many as one incorrect amino acid for every 100. How do proteins know what to modify? They don't. Chemistry is not a directed process. It follows the laws of physics. Methyl transferases, for example, are attracted to CPG sites, that is a cytosine phosphate guanine site, because its active site is attracted to the carbon atom adjacent to the amine group, which results in it sticking a methyl molecule there, which is a carbon attached to three hydrogen atoms. Methyl transferases didn't have to be told to go there. Nothing in the so-called instruction manual said, and now methyl transferase will be created and it will go methylate a cytosine. Again, this is because DNA is not a book. Uh, it's a molecule that reacts in a multitude of ways with other molecules, and the emergent properties of these interactions construct a cell. The interactions between cells are what create tissues, organ systems, and organisms. These are the most basic facts of biology. So while it's useful to sometimes describe the genome as an instruction manual, it's just a simple analogy, not a literalism. Sanford spends the first chapter trying to impress upon his reader that the genome is literally a book. It is the instruction manual of life. All the while, he spends next to no time on arguably the other critically important component of DNA, 
it is the heritable material, and it is this fact that permits us to trace all life back to a universal common ancestor, because written in this instruction manual, if you will, is also the genealogy of all extant organisms. He tries to build this case because his critique of what he calls the primary axiom relies on this analogy being literally true. He believes that evolutionary biology claims that all living things arose via a process of random mutation and selection. Of course, these are just two processes of evolution. There's also gene flow, genetic drift, and non-random mating, not to mention recombination that could be thrown in there as well, but we won't quibble. His beef is with the core mechanisms of evolution. He equates this primary axiom to neo-Darwinism. I'm not going to bother going into the history of what is and is not neo-Darwinism. It doesn't matter to the purposes of what, we, what he wants to call it. Uh, the kicker follows this, in which he writes, quote, What is an axiom? An axiom is a concept that is not testable and is accepted by faith because it seems obviously true to all reasonable parties. On this basis, it is accepted as an absolute truth. Is mutation and natural selection akin to an axiom? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, each are processes that may or may not be true, and both could easily be falsified. If Sanford were correct that mutations never produce novelty, then he might be justified. But this is a bogus claim. We have hundreds of examples of novel genes. For example, the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, has a gene that other members of the genus don't that produces a unique dynein structure in the axoneme of their sperm cells. This complex protein structure emerged first via gene duplication, followed by three independent deletions and a dozen amino acid substitutions. Hence, the mutational process alone constructed a novel structure without genomic reduction. The original protein is still produced and works just fine. So, Sanford is wrong just straight out the gate. What about natural selection? Is that just an axiom, too, that we accept without scrutiny? For the time being, let's just let that one marinate. There's an entire chapter dedicated to selection, and we'll have ample opportunity to dig into this. Sanford goes on to argue that since the genome is an instruction manual, random mutations can never make it better. These typographical errors always degrade the message, never construct it. He cites Richard Dawkins' example from The Blind Watchmaker, in which he coded up a program with a target sequence of, Me thinks it is like a weasel. Dawkins chose this line in response to the common creationist trope of the time that evolution via random mutation and selection was akin to sitting a bunch of chimpanzees in front of a typewriter and expecting them to hammer out Shakespeare. The phrase itself comes from Hamlet, who is playing the fool to Polonius. Dawkins' little program works by generating random letters every generation and keeping the ones that get closer to me thinks it is like a weasel. The program rapidly finds the target sequence thanks to the action of selection. Sanford cries foul, writing, quote, This program supposedly proved that evolution via mutation selection is inevitable, not requiring any intelligent design. Obviously, Dawkins used an intelligently designed cr computer, and then he used his own intelligence to design the program, to optimize it, and even to design the, pre the pre-selected phrase. This is a lazy, nonsensical retort. The point was to show that simple rules can generate the appearance of design, and the rules encoded into the program are those presumed by the mutation selection process. Using Sanford's logic here, nothing could count as evidence for evolution because it took humans to design the experiments or collect the data. The first chapter closes with these bizarre pictures. Um, the books are meant to represent the genome, again, an instruction manual, and the objects are what is being specified. Um, this has always struck me as silly. I, I suspect his argument would lose a great deal of potency among his followers if he showed the library of a human genome against the size of the library of an amoeba. The amoeba's genome is more than a hundred times larger than humans, so Sanford would need to admit that it takes far more books to build a microscopic unicellular organism than it does a human, God's chosen monkey. Chapter 2 Newsflash, which is just an answer to the rhetorical question posed by the chapter's title, here's a newsflash. If you're going to begin a chapter with a rhetorical question, 
Don't give the answer to the question right away. It should unfold as part of the content of the chapter. Just, you know, some pointers, one writer to another. He begins by claiming that the primary axiom views mutations as good. They create variation and diversity, which allow selection and evolution to occur. He rejects this and claims that all health agencies aimed at reducing mutational exposure that cause cancer demonstrates the primary axiom must be wrong. But then he does this weird little dance. He writes, quote, We need to realize that there are two types of variation. There is random variation and designed variation. Ah. You see, he describes this first kind of variation like rust on a car, typographical errors on a student's term paper, throwing rocks at a glass house. Yes, three different analogies for this process back to back. I have no idea how throwing rocks at a glass house is like mutation, but hey, he's the Cornell geneticist. He then treats us to designed variation. This is the variation in the car itself. What color is it? What are the rims like? Does it have a disc changer? Whatever. These options, he writes, quote, were useful to me in making my selection and have, quote, proven useful to me later on. They are beneficial, useful for sustaining my car, and are even useful for improving my car within limits. I'm at a loss with his analogy. He states that the second one basically doesn't exist, or that at least it's not produced via mutation. So he's drawing this convenient line. If variation is bad, it's from mutation. If it's good, it's from God. How do you know it's from God? Because it's good. See how, see how that works? If there are segregating genetic variants in a population, they are the result of mutation, irrespective of if they're good or bad. How can we know this? Because all populations have a single coalescent ancestor at some point in the past. Never met a creationist that didn't agree with this. That means any variation that exists in populations have emerged since that ancestor. Now, if you believe that God has come down and and sprinkled some design variation dust on lineages since that ancestor, fine, but it's indistinguishable from mutation. This is why the concept of created heterozygosity is so bankrupt. Uh, I have video and link in the description below on my video for that particular topic. Sanford argues that we should consider design diversity because now many organisms do have design diversity. That is, there exist genetically modified crops. He writes, quote, perhaps this simple fact can open our minds to the possibility of design genetic variation which preceded man. There's no logic in this statement. We might as well ponder, well, since man can build a bicycle, there must be things that built bicycles that preceded man. Sanford goes on to make two claims. One, that the vast majority of mutations are deleterious, and two, that even when beneficial mutations occur, they're mostly reductive. He writes, quote, the primary axiom insists that mutations are good and are the building blocks in which evolution creates the galaxy of information currently existing in the genome. He then makes another long analogy involving randomly changing letters in a paragraph. I'm going to explain how not only are the preponderance of deleterious mutations not a problem for evolution, but that it is a prediction of evolutionary theory. We didn't need to measure a single distribution of fitness effect to conclude it must be this way. Let me explain. Most populations in nature are relatively stable. They aren't growing or shrinking in size, but maintain a roughly constant long-term average population size. For this to be the case, mean population fitness must hover around one. That is, on average, parents are having enough children to replace themselves. Now let's imagine for any loci in the genome there are two possible states, A and B. This could be any sort of genetic variant, from a single nucleotide to a structural polymorphism. Um, and further, that the A state has lower fitness than the B state. Now, a transition in states at the population level is what we call a substitution. So, a transition from an A to a B is a beneficial substitution. A transition from a B to an A is deleterious. We can denote these as U A to B for the beneficial and U B to A for the deleterious. Conditional on them going to fixation, any beneficial variant is promoted by selection and hence fixes in the population quite rapidly. 
but selection does not favor deleterious mutations. The only way they can go to fixation is via genetic drift, which is very slow. So we know intuitively that U A to B must be greater than U B to A. The cumulative rate of change of a population is then the probability that the population is in one of those states at any point in time multiplied by the rate of transitioning out of that state. For a population to be at fitness equilibrium, as most populations appear to be, then the probability you are in the better state, B, multiplied by the rate of change from B to A, must be equal to the probability you are in the worse state, A, multiplied by the rate of change from A to B. If these weren't equal, the population would either be growing or collapsing in size. But we've already stated that U sub A to B is greater than U sub B to A. So how can this equality exist? Well, it implies that the probability of being in the better state, B, must exceed the probability of being in the worse state, A. This exactly cancels the increased rate of beneficial substitutions and you have a fitness equilibrium. Okay, well that's the substitution rate, but what about the mutation rate? Unlike the substitution rate, the mutation rate is only concerned with the occurrence of variation as opposed to its fate. Well, let's imagine we don't know the mutation rate from A to B or B to A, can we still predict which should be greater given what we learned just a moment ago about the conditions to maintain fitness equilibrium? Yes. So, like before, the cumulative deleterious rate of mutation is then the probability of an individual being in state B multiplied by the mutation rate from B to A. The beneficial is then the probability of an individual being in state A multiplied by the rate from A to B. Notice that this implies that to maintain fitness equilibrium, the deleterious mutation rate must exceed the beneficial rate. This is because, as we've already shown, the probability of being in state B exceeds that of being in state A. And so without ever needing to measure the actual mutation rate, we can conclude that the deleterious rate should be greater any time that we observe a stable population. Hence, Sanford's claim that the deleterious mutation rate falsifies the primary axiom is just false on its face. You know, I think sometimes about how odd it is for me, a junior scientist, to have to point out such a simple and obvious mistake to someone like Sanford, an established and respected plant geneticist, inventor of the gene gun. The second part of his claim, that beneficial mutations are almost always reductive, is also nonsensical. We have hundreds of examples of novel genes emerging from non-reductive processes, that is, mechanisms like duplication followed by neo-functionalization that preserves the original gene function. We also know of cases of de novo gene origin from non-coding sequences. Neither of these degrade any pre-existing information. The remaining part of the chapter is dedicated to one of Sanford's most infamous blunders, his portrayal of the distribution of fitness effects. In case you're unaware, Sanford incorporates the hypothetical distribution of fitness effects from Moto Kimura's 1979 paper on effective neutrality and selective constraint in his simulations using Mendel's accountant. These simulations all show that populations lose fitness over time due to the accumulation of mutations. Of course, Kimura never meant this distribution to be a real distribution. He notes in the paper that he is excluding beneficial mutations entirely because he's interested only in the effects of selective constraint with respect to effective neutrality. It's right in the title. But Sanford writes, quote, in Kimura's figure, he does not show any mutations to the right of zero. There are zero beneficial mutations shown. He obviously considered beneficial mutations so rare as to be outside of consideration. But this is false. Kimura certainly considered them to be rare, but not outside of consideration. Kimura actually writes in that paper that he doesn't consider them because the model that he presents breaks down when they are incorporated. The reason for this is because the model itself assumes that all mutations are independent of the environment, that is, the environment is constant. If you have a constant supply of beneficial mutations in an unchanging environment, the population explodes in size, as Kimura shows at the end of the paper. 
And this touches on the discussion we just had, that fitness equilibrium is achieved by a delicate balance between deleterious and beneficial mutations, and that this balance is only reached if deleterious mutations exceed the beneficial ones. Sanford goes on to ask then, quote, how can theorists possibly explain evolutionary progress? There are two key problems with this question. Um, he sees everything in this sort of antiquated ladder of progress, but this idea is simply not part of evolutionary theory. There is no organism on the planet more advanced than any other, because advanced is not a biological concept, it's a social concept. Now, we can talk about differences in complexity, which has an interesting biological implications, but Progress does not mean complexity and vice versa. One can be complex and yet not advanced. This is because complexity can emerge in silly ways via elaborate redundancy. See my video on the evolution of genomic complexity for an explanation of this. Second, let's reword this to how can theorists possibly explain adaptation? Because I think this is a more interesting question. Obviously, adaptation is the lack of fitness equilibrium. The population is increasing increasing in fitness, and hence it's growing in size. This is rarely directly observed, though famous examples exist, like the Anolis radiation in the Caribbean and, of course, Darwin's finches. The reason for this is that adaptation is quite rapid, and populations are rarely limited by genetic variation. Thus, when a population enters a new environment, or the environment they're occupying changes, the fitness landscape changes, and they are rapidly pushed to a new adaptive peak. This initially results in a widespread loss of fitness, followed by a rapid increase in fitness until the new fitness maxima is achieved, and then subsequent stabilization. The rate of increase of fitness due to this shift in fitness effects is only constrained by Haldane's famous cost of selection, an idea that Sanford just doesn't understand, which will come up later. Um, if you're interested in the gory mathematical details of selection and adaptive landscapes, see my video on fitness and natural selection. This also explains concepts like morphological stasis in the fossil record. At a fitness maxima, population should equilibrate and strong stabilizing selection maintains the mean phenotype. So long as the environment doesn't change, the population is not pushed to change. I should make clear here that environment is not merely the abiotic, it's also the biotic, so populations must evolve in response to predators, prey, parasites, etc. as well, so a changing environment might also include the introduction of a new parasite or predator as well, which itself can shift fitness landscapes despite not changing the abiotic environment. The answer Sanford gives to this question of explaining progress is nonsensical. He writes, quote, it is done as follows. Everything in the near neutral box is redefined as completely neutral and is thereby dismissed. It is then assumed that mutations to the left of the near neutral box can be entirely eliminated using natural selection. Having eliminated all deleterious mutations in these two ways, the theorists are then free to argue that no matter how rare beneficial mutations may be, there should now be enough time and enough selection power left over to rescue them and use them as the building blocks of evolution. It's baffling to me that Sanford can make this statement after literally just introducing Kimura's paper, which is about the influence of deleterious, unselectable, i.e. effectively neutral mutations. In that very paper, Kimura shows that by including even slightly beneficial mutations, the population explodes in size. If you're going to use that paper to make your argument, it helps to not say the exact opposite thing of what the paper shows. It makes you look dishonest. So let's be clear about Sanford's argument so far. Most mutations are deleterious, many of those are very slightly deleterious, such that they are effectively neutral, and beneficial mutations are so rare as to be incapable of salvaging the species. Sanford only vaguely defines the effect of neutrality as unselectable mutations. The closest he comes to actually telling us what these are or how these are determined is the line, quote, Kimura's somewhat arbitrary cutoff or unselectable he calculates as a function of N sub E, the number of reproducing individuals within a breeding population. He goes on to write, quote, it is important to note that Kimura's box size, which he calculates based upon population size, is only a minimal 
estimate of the extent of the effect of neutral mutations. The actual box size should be enlarged by any and all non-genetic factors that can affect reproductive probability. This paragraph is honestly what convinced me that Sanford has exactly zero idea what he's talking about. I don't think he's lying, as some might. I think he's genuinely ignorant. I think this Cornell geneticist genuinely doesn't understand population genetics or even like the basic concepts of genetic drift. Let's, let's explain what effective neutrality means, showing why it's not some arbitrary cutoff, and then we'll touch briefly on his second claim about the box size. We'll return to this later since he has an entire chapter dedicated to it. So let's start off by looking at the distribution of fitness effects he shows. Notice the x-axis. It's in ticks of 0.001. So within the box of effective neutrality is the range 0.005 and negative 0.0005. Where do these numbers come from? Why is that the box size he chooses to show? These questions are never answered. Sanford does not explain his arbitrary choice of x-axis, nor does he seem to understand what it represents. Here's two distributions that he shows. See how they also seem to just have a random x-axis of values? The distribution of fitness effects, shortened to the DFE, is a plot of fitness effects on the x-axis of each individual mutation and the count of those mutations that fall within that effect on the y-axis. So a mutation whose fitness is, say, negative 0.001 falls here. If there are 100 mutations with the same effect, then we increase the size of gray shading above that tick. Okay, that's simple enough to understand, but what about this box that he's showing? These are, as I said before, what he considers in this distribution to be the effectively neutral mutations. The ones unseen by selection, though strictly speaking, they have some effect. The concept of effective neutrality emerges from Kimura's early work incorporating diffusion equations into the study of the interplay between natural selection and genetic drift. He wanted to understand how the two impacted each other, and so he studied allele frequencies and how they vary from one generation to the next, and how much of that variance was attributed to the two forces. Every generation, some amount of that variance in allele frequencies is determined solely by random processes. For natural selection to be efficient, its effect must exceed the variance caused by chance. Shown here is a simple graph that tries to capture this. In this example, notice how the variance induced by selection exceeds that of drift. When this is the case, selection dominates. We can write the condition of this as simply s is greater than 1 over 2 n sub e. This is because the variance of allele frequencies due to chance is dictated by what we call the effective population size. In Kimura's measurements, this term is akin to the expected variance each generation due to genetic drift alone, which he writes as P1 minus P divided by the variance in delta P. Here's another graph showing large variance in frequencies. The difference between this graph and the previous is the effect of population size. This one is much smaller, and so notice how selection, if it's going to drive changes in the population, must have proportionally larger effect to overcome the variance in frequencies caused by drift alone. We should see now that the strength of selection relative to the effective population size, which again is a measure of the variance in allele frequencies due to chance, is what dictates the scale of the box of effective neutrality. So let's return to Sanford's box. What effective population size corresponds to a box of 0 0.0005 and negative 0 0.0005? That corresponds to an effective population size of only 1,000. This is because 1 over 2n, where n equals 1,000, is 0 0.0005. So for Sanford's x-axis to be relevant, biologically speaking, a population would need to be extremely small. Now, the effective population size is not exactly the census size, but it is a proxy for it. An effective size of 1,000 would be a population teetering on the brink of extinction. So what's the effective population size of humans? This is a tricky question, because humans have experienced a very recent and rapid population expansion, and so we need to frame our question relative to the timescale of interest. 
Without getting into the gory details here, one way we can think about the effect of population size is as a measure of the long-term equilibrium size, often called the inbreeding effect of size, which is dictated by events that were happening deep into the past. This measure comes from levels of genetic diversity, as diversity accumulates very slowly over time since the last common ancestor of the population. This measure places humans around 10,000, a very small effective population size. Now this number reflects ancient bottlenecks and the generally smaller population sizes that humans have had for most of our history. While this number can tell us something about how selection might have acted in the past and hence tells us about how much deleterious variation we might be harboring, it is not the value of relevance to how selection is behaving in the present or into the future. This is better represented by what we call the variance effect of size, which I already introduced previously. This is a measure of population size from how much allele frequencies vary from generation to generation, and as Kimura pointed out, this is ultimately what selection acts on, on this generational variance. Hence, if we want to understand what the effective size of humans is with respect to natural selection happening now, we need to investigate the variance in allele frequencies happening today. Imagine a brand new mutation that occurs in some individual in Ohio, okay? Let's condition on that mutation eventually reaching fixation and assume that it's neutral. Given that there are now over 8 billion people on the planet, what would you predict the per-generational variance in that allele frequency will look like? Will it jump around like the graph on the top here? Or would you expect it to be very small like the one on the bottom? Do you think this variance is reflected best by the long-term inbreeding size of humans of 10,000? Or is it something closer to the census size of 8 billion that humans are sitting at today? When a population has undergone a recent expansion, these two measures of effective population size become decoupled. And the one that is of relevance depends on the question we're asking. Again, if we're concerned with selection happening now, the variance effective size is actually what we care about, not the long-term equilibrium population size. So let's reshape Sanford's x-axis to one that more accurately captures this for humans. Let's assume the variance effective size of humans is 7 billion, a billion individuals smaller than the census size. A side note here, geographic structure actually inflates the effective population size, so this number is actually quite conservative. The bounds of the effective neutrality box should range between values of negative 1 over 2n less than s and positive 1 over 2n is less than s. And if n is equal to 7 billion, then these ticks should be 7.1 e to the negative 11 and negative 7.1 e to the negative 11. Values greater than those numbers indicate that alleles are not effectively neutral. See how much smaller those numbers should be than what Sanford showed? This is going to be important later, so just file that away in the back of your mind. His next chapter carries on the tradition of asking a rhetorical question in the chapter title and then answering it in the newsflash below. The topic of this chapter is the mutational load, the observation that deleterious mutations are numerous in humans and that this has caused several population geneticists, notably Herman Muller and James Crow, to voice concerns about potential impacts. Sanford writes, quote, There have persisted serious concerns about accumulating mutations in man, leading to a high genetic load in a generally degenerating population. He then cites the famous one deleterious mutation per person per generation number as the limit to what the human population could theoretically tolerate. Um, this value is arrived at via a couple of simplifying assumptions and considering the human fertility rate. And... As it turns out, these simplifying assumptions are likely why this idea is false. Imagine a population with a deleterious mutation rate per generation, u. To estimate the fitness effect of this rate, we need to make some assumptions. First, let's assume that all mutations are additive, no dominance and no epistasis. Let's also assume that selection acts on viability, so individuals are born and then either survive to reproduce or they don't. 
let's also assume that all mutational targets are equal, that is 100% genome functionality. Finally, let's assume that all mutations are acting multiplicatively, such that we can simply multiply them together to get their total fitness effects. All of those assumptions are necessary for the model of genetic load that Sanford cites to work. This is the model that Muller uses in his famous 1950 paper and the one that Crow uses in 71. Indeed, it is violations of these assumptions that have served as the resolution to the so-called mutation load paradox, which we'll get into in a moment. Okay, so with those assumptions, let's plug in some numbers. The genetic load is then L equal to 1 minus E raised to the negative U. If the mutation rate is 1e e to the negative 8, that's around 100 new mutations every generation on average. So if one of them is deleterious, then L is equal to 0.63. That is 63% of the population fail to reproduce due to the genetic load. To compensate for this failure to reproduce, those that do reproduce would need to have 5.4 children on average. While this is technically within the capacity of humans, it's twice the average in the modern age. So what's the actual number of deleterious mutations? Uh, it's hard to say, but some estimates are as high as 10. Is this a tolerable genetic load? Well, Sanford obviously doesn't think so. Uh, he thinks that the number of deleterious mutations is actually even higher than this. He spends the rest of the chapter trying to convince us that the number is in the thousands by counting every possible mutation type separately instead of considering them as a single deleterious mutation, regardless of if it's a point mutation or a structural variant. So let's ask the infamous question of population genetics geneticist Alexei Kondrashov, why have we not died a hundred times over? The answer is actually quite simple. Genetics is more complicated than the assumptions of the genetic load argument permit. First, mutations differ in their dominance coefficients, and most deleterious mutations are recessive. When this is the case, they are effectively hidden in heterozygotes. Indeed, we're all heterozygous for what are probably some pretty nasty mutations but they have zero effect because they're compensated for by the alternate allele. Now, this is important with respect to the second assumption that selection acts on viability. We actually have good evidence that selection is mostly at the level of the zygote. Around 40% of all fertilized eggs are spontaneously aborted. Imagine you and your partner are heterozygous for many deleterious mutations, as must be the case. Assuming selection doesn't act at the level of the gamete, that is, whenever these deleterious alleles are in the haploid state in the gamete, they die, and so there's never a chance of getting passed on in the first place, this is called fertility selection, then we can write the expected distributions of pairing using Mendelian proportions. For a single locus model, we expect 75% of the zygotic combinations to harbor the better allele either in the homozygous or in the heterozygous state. And so 25% of the time, a fertilization event could result in a homozygous combination for the deleterious allele, and this may result in a spontaneous abortion. Is this costly? Well, a woman is born with around 2 million eggs, and by the time she reaches menopause, will still have a few thousand, far more than could ever physically be born. That is, she possesses an excess reproductive capacity. Since women ovulate once a month for 12 months, if we assume 20 years as the average time of fertility, then she could, in theory, have 240 chances at a successful combination of sperm and egg that wins the Mendelian lottery. To maintain a constant population size, this lottery only needs to be won twice out of the 240 possible chances. While this is the upper limit and obviously exceeds what any woman would actually experience, it demonstrates how much cheaper selection is at this level. Contrast this with viability selection in which she invests in children that never reproduce. If they are never born in the first place, as 40% of fertilized eggs aren't, then the cost is dramatically reduced. She could have two offspring, but paid the mutational burden 10 times over and have never known it. This is akin to how other species pay the cost of mutation. Large-bodied vertebrates live a long time, relatively speaking, and so have many chances at mating. This means they can get the combination right before investing in a few offspring that they will actually give birth to. This is different than how many insects reproduce. Since they will often only mate once in their lifetime, they will fertilize every single egg they possess and lay them all at once. 
Males provide females not with a single sperm, but a sperm packet with all sorts of gametic combinations. Hence, some of the fertilized eggs win the lottery, and some don't. The average fruit fly lays 500 eggs. So even if 99% of them fail due to deleterious mutations, they will still have five viable offspring. The next assumption we made was that 100% of the genome is functional. This is a gross overestimate in humans. We have definitive evidence of functionality for only around 10% of the human genome. More than 40% of it are defunct transposons, another 10% dead retroviruses, and at least 30% are intronic sequences, the vast majority of which are snipped out and degraded during mRNA processing. This alone resolves the mutational load. If we set the functional fraction to 10%, then u equals 100 times 0.1 times 0.01 equals 0.1, and so l is 0.095, and the number of offspring needed to make up for this load is 2.1. Lastly, we assume that all mutations act multiplicatively. That is, if you know the effect of one in isolation, you can just multiply this effect for all the other mutations in isolation. This is obviously incorrect. We know that loci act epistatically with one another. For example, a single mutation in a regulatory network might be compensated for if the network is robust, and so the effect could be very small. But two such mutations onto the same background, the entire regulatory network could collapse. You would obviously not have predicted this by simply multiplying the effects of the two individuals by themselves. And we have good evidence of this exact kind of thing occurring. A study in Science by Sohail and colleagues in 2017 found in both humans and fruit flies that deleterious alleles appear to be in repulsion. This means that they appeared on the same background far less than what you would expect given Mendelian segregation alone. We call this negative linkage disequilibrium, and it's evidence of epistatic interaction between alleles. This is also what happens if the homozygous zygote is spontaneously aborted. You never see the two alleles on the same genetic background. This is also irrespective of their independent effects, as I already stated. When on the same background, their fitness effects go can go from minor to lethal. Each of these violations act to make selection more efficient. Epistatic interactions and selection on gametic compatibility are both incredibly strong forces that are cheap because eggs are relatively cheap, as are mating events and large vertebrates like us. Hence, Sanford's argument only works in a cartoonish world in which all simplistic assumptions of the genetic load model are met. I want to be clear that I'm not saying the genetic load model is not useful. It's a valuable model in conservation genetics, especially. But when population geneticists use it, we don't take it as gospel. We understand that it has a series of assumptions, and so we coach our language in understanding those assumptions. Sanford gives you none of that. He wants you to take it at face value and use it to construct an entire false worldview. His next chapter is about natural selection itself. Thus far, Sanford has focused this argument on mutations themselves, arguing from the mutational load, the deleterious mutation rate is too high, and from the drift load, selection is too weak to distinguish mutations of small effect and beneficial mutations are too rare and are ultimately reductive anyway. In this chapter, he asks, all powerful natural selection to the rescue? When I guess with the news flash states, Sanford writes, quote, for many people, including many biologists, natural selection is like a magic wand. There seems to be no limit to what one can imagine it accomplishing. He then goes on to write, concerning population geneticists, like yours truly, the only scientists who have actually seriously analyzed what selection can and cannot do are a small number of population geneticists. Population genetics is a field that is extremely theoretical and mathematical. Theoretical mathematicians are completely constrained by their axioms, assumptions, upon which they build their work. The entire field of population genetics was developed by a small, tightly knit group of people who were utterly and radically committed to the primary axiom. Today, it is still a very small field, still exclusively populated by true believers in the primary axiom. 
These people are extremely intelligent, but are totally and unconditionally bound to the primary axiom. For the most part, other biologists do not even understand their work and accept their conclusions by faith. When we write about the genetic load, he loves us. When we write about selection and adaptation, he hates us. To be the object of Sanford's infatuation is a tiring chore. From here, he introduces what he sees as a major limitation to natural selection, what he calls the princess and the nucleotide paradox. This idea comes from the children's story, The Princess and the Pea, in which a princess fills a pea under 13 mattresses. Um, this is meant to be akin to natural selection acting on the nucleotide level. Um, since selection acts on individuals, selecting an individual nucleotide is akin to feeling a pea through 13 mattresses, I guess? He goes on to give a ton of random examples of this. Uh, Pixels on a TV, an individual soldier in an army, a butterfly wing in the face of a hurricane. The man is never late on delivering silly analogies. Uh, to Sanford, if selection cannot distinguish nucleotides, then it's far too weak to weed out mutations. After all, if it's acting on the individual level, how can it tell the difference in the generational deluge between good, bad, and neutral? Doesn't it just pick them all at once? Sanford claims that those philosophically committed Darwinists who realized they had to devise a way to overcome the princess and nucleotide paradox cleverly transferred the unit of selection from the whole organism to the genetic unit. Uh, we dastardly population geneticists redefined populations as nothing more than a pool of genes. So, we could then ignore the issue of linkage and just pretend selection acted on each gene independently. He writes, quote, This effectively removed the mattresses from under the princess. He states, Darwinism would have died very naturally at this point in time, except for this major intellectual invention. Uh, he cites Provi 1971, which is a lovely little book that you all need to go read right now. Um, in the footnote, he gives the quote, Haldane intended, as had Fisher and Wright, to dispel the belief that Mendelism had killed Darwinism. Fisher, Holden, and Wright then quantitatively synthesized Mendelian heredity and natural selection into the science of population genetics. This quote was meant to somehow justify his assertion that Darwinism would be dead if population genetics hadn't thought about populations as pools of genes. Um, if you've seen my video of People's History of Darwinism, you know that's not at all what Provine is talking about here. It's also always a little silly to me that creationists see deceit everywhere in the evolutionary community. They genuinely believe that we true believers know there's something wrong with our ideas, and so we're always trying to find ways to rescue it. And so we come up with gene pools to save us from the scary princess and the nucleotide paradox, and we try to sound really smart and mathy about it so no other biologist will ever question us. The real reason why the early models considered gene pools was not because of some fear of Sanford's made-up paradox, but because it follows Mendel's laws of segregation. This law states that two genes are inherited independently of one another, and this is true in the cases of genes being on different chromosomes. It's also true thanks to recombination, which shuffles genes, even those very close to one another, given that recombination equilibrium has been reached, what we call linkage equilibrium. So far from Sanford's paranoia, the idea of gene pools is a simple application of the laws of Mendelian inheritance. Now, it is true that selection acts at the level of the individual, so let's then ask the question, how can selection ever be said to be acting on a single nucleotide? Let's imagine the case in which a beneficial mutation emerges on a single haploid chromosome in a single individual. This individual will pass their entire chromosome and all associated alleles to the next generation at a greater frequency than others. But as this mutation spreads through the population, it starts to recombine with other homologous chromosomes. This separates the beneficial mutation from its original background, including any deleterious variants it might have been dragging along with it. Indeed, if it recombines off that background to a better one, it becomes even more fit. 
by the time it goes to fixation within the population, the number of loci that are still in linkage can be quite small, on the order of tens of thousands, which is a mere fraction of the genome. This process is called a selective sweep, and it has been recognized since 1974 when it was introduced in a groundbreaking paper by Maynard Smith and John Haig. They showed that the interaction between the fitness effect of the allele and the recombination rate dictated the degree of linkage between alleles and nearby loci. For loci under very strong selection, alleles tended to drag much larger segments to fixation with them, reducing diversity around themselves. For more moderate selection, recombination has ample opportunities to break up linkages between the allele and all the neighboring ones, and diversity is maintained. This produces plots like the one shown here. In the center is the target of natural selection. That dip in diversity around this target is the result of linkage, neighboring loci that have not yet recombined off that genetic background. Over time, recombination will eventually remove all signatures of the sweep, and what will result is a single locus being fixed. What Sanford fails to understand about selection is the same basic thing that all creationists fail to grasp, that evolution is a population-level process. At the level of the population, selection actually does fine-tune single nucleotides over time. This doesn't happen in one generation. The time it takes is on the scale of the recombination rate and the selection coefficient favoring that allele. Thus, the princess and the nucleotide paradox is no paradox at all, and the assumption of pools of genes is not some subversive tactic employed to pull the wool over the eyes of the non-population geneticist. It is instead the simple application of Mendel's law to the population level. Sanford goes on to complain about population geneticists at length. He writes, quote, To justify this radical new picture of life, the theorists had to axiomatically assume a number of things which were all known to be clearly false. For example, they had to assume that all genetic units could sort independently. He goes on, they had to assume no epistasis, as though there were no interactions between nucleotides. As we've already shown, he's just shooting himself in the foot here. In the previous chapter, he was totally fine with this assumption when it showed that there was a genetic load, but he's now more than willing to call out those same population geneticists for any assumptions at all when it helps his case. The fact is that these epistatic interactions are what undermine the concept of genetic load in the first place. He writes, quote, they also typically assumed essentially infinite population sizes and then added, obviously false. I wonder if he thinks any population geneticist thinks that there are actually infinite populations. That we're, are, are we like pretend, we're not actually telling anybody, right? Nobody actually knows that we're assuming infinite populations. We don't even, we don't even write that in the papers. Don't even read our papers. We don't want you to know. That's our assumption, but you don't know that it's our assumption. He laments, quote, From the very beginning of population genetic theory, many unrealistic and unreasonable assumptions were needed to make the model appear even feasible. Sanford is, yet again, exposing his profound ignorance. All models in science are simplifications. Every one of them. The point is not to capture every aspect of reality, but to model a specific aspect of it to prime our expectations of what we might see in the real world. For example, if I'm interested in understanding the difference between natural selection acting on a dominant allele versus a recessive one, I don't need to model population size. I don't care about drift in this setting. That's not part of the question. So I'll assume an infinite population size. This restricts my results to only differences in dominance, which is what my question is about. Now, if I'm interested in the interaction between selection on dominance and genetic drift, then I model population size. This is just how statistical modeling works. No model is meant to match perfectly biological reality. It's only meant to approximate it, and to approximate it as simply as possible. If my simple model is actually capable of predicting something in nature, then all the more power to it. And that's exactly what theoretical population genetics has done. We construct models with loads of simplistic assumptions, and yet they are robust to violations of those assumptions. Indeed, the most simple population genetic model is Hardy-Weinberg. It has a ton of assumptions, and yet it is an incredibly robust model. So robust, in fact, that it underlies the basis of ancestry 
ancestry tests. We are under no illusion that we are modeling reality exactly as it is. We don't even want to. If we could model reality exactly as it is, we wouldn't need to model it. We'd already know everything there is to know. That's the whole point. Overly complex models tend to not tell you anything of interest that the data itself can't tell you. Powerful models are precise yet simple, such that you can disentangle all the component parts. But according to Sanford, quote, on this false foundation were built the theoretical pillars of modern population genetics. The models did not match biological reality, but these men had an incredible aura of intellectual authority. Their arguments were very abstract, and they used highly mathematical formulations, which could effectively intimidate biologists. You feel intimidated, John? Is that what this is really about? He goes on, in fact, the early population geneticists quickly became the idolized darlings of science. Even if their premises were false, their conclusions must still doubtless be true. They were geniuses. The close of this chapter and a large portion of the next is dedicated to what he calls the cost of selection. Um, he attributes this to Haldane's 1957 paper by the same name, but the concept is not the same. Um, Haldane was evaluating what's known as the substitution load, the cost of a beneficial allele spreading through a population. He noted whenever a beneficial allele emerges, or when a population enters a new environment and one of the alleles it already possesses becomes beneficial, then the entire fitness of the population suddenly decreases. This is because most of the individuals harbor a less fit variant. Thus, there exists a cost proportional to the rate of increase of the beneficial variant to the population in terms of selective deaths, the number of genetic lineages that must die for this one allele to become the dominant one in the population. Importantly, this assumes that selection is not competitive, but is acting at the level of viability as before. This distinction is very important. If selection is competitive, that means that individuals are vying for resources in an environment. If two individuals come upon a resource they both need, the one with the beneficial allele gains an advantage equal to the selection coefficient. In this way, the selection coefficient depends on the interaction themselves. If both competitors have the allele, then resource acquisition may be dictated by chance. Hence, the cost to reproduction is dependent on the context of the interactions of individuals, not simply on like raw survival probability. Haldane saw the cost of selection as placing a limit on how many beneficial alleles could be spreading through a population at one time. Too many would incur a prohibitive reproductive cost, as those with the beneficial allele would need to have an inordinate amount of offspring to compensate for those having no offspring. Actually, many organisms can pay even very high cost. As in the case of fruit flies I mentioned earlier, that can lay up to 500 eggs at one time. A single individual could, then, in theory, compensate for the lack of reproduction of 250 flies just by themselves. Regardless, this is not what Sanford means by the cost of selection. He means what we mentioned before regarding the genetic load, that for every mutation, some number of individuals fail to reproduce and the population has to compensate for it. It has to pay the cost, in Sanford's term, for that failure. We've already has shown why this argument is bunk. It relies on very simple assumptions that Sanford just finished complaining about. As soon as we incorporate a little bit more biological realism, the issue vanishes. After all, we haven't died a hundred times over, in case you haven't noticed. The next chapter finally starts tying all of these different ideas together, though in a way that is confusing and conflating many separate ideas and population genetics with one another. Um, in this chapter, he promises us that selection cannot rescue the genome. Let's recap his arguments. Most mutations are deleterious. Many of these are effectively neutral, virtually no beneficial mutation to compensate for these, and that selection can't get rid of these because it can't act on the nucleotide level, can't see effectively neutral ones, and then when it does act, it imparts too large of a cost on the population. In this chapter, he tries to bring all of these things together, starting exactly where he ended the last chapter with the cost of selection. The man really needs an editor. He uses Haldane's cost of selection argument to claim that selection can't act on many traits simultaneously because of the cost that it imparts. 
But remember, Haldane's cost is about the spread of a beneficial allele, not the purging of deleterious ones. These processes are not analogous. Genetic load is derived under equilibrium conditions between mutation and selection, and the cost, which is maximal at equilibrium, it's as high as the cost can be at equilibrium, can be derived from that. But that's not how the cost is measured in Haldane's model. The cost of positive selection is dictated by how rapidly a beneficial trait is spreading, and hence how many traits need to spread. As you can see, the mechanisms of these two things are quite different. The next argument is based on the nearly neutral mutations, which are what he calls the silent ones that selection can't see at all. He writes, quote, the orderly elimination of minor mutations is seriously disrupted by noise. And we get another analogy. It is a little like trying to see the ripples produced by a pebble thrown into a stormy sea. He goes on to write, quote, genetic drift has been extensively studied, and it is well known that it can override selection against all but the most severe mutations in a small population. Again, another analogy, this time, trying to hear a whisper in a noisy room. Sanford comes to the strange conclusion that as selection acts on more traits, that makes each trait behave as effectively neutral, because the cost would be too high. He writes, quote, Simultaneous selection against too many minor mutants should lead to zero selective progress, and genetic drift takes over. In essence, selecting for too many minor mutations simultaneously make them all behave as near neutrals. This does not follow at all. This conclusion is arrived at completely nonsensically. If the cost of selection is too high, the population goes extinct. It doesn't transition to a state of near neutral. If it can't tolerate the genetic load, it can't tolerate it. There, there's no point at which genetic drift takes over. That, that's just not how this works. It's difficult to even address this because the premise is wrong. Right? Like he's trying to construct an argument using the wrong model. Uh, Haldane's cost of selection for a beneficial allele applied to the wrong problem, the mutation selection balance. He shows a bunch of figures at the end of the chapter, but they're all derived assuming Haldane's cost. That is, natural selection can only favor a limited number of alleles at a time. Since this has no bearing on whether selection can purge recurrent mutation, I'm at a loss on how to proceed other than just say, no. No. This next chapter is what we've been waiting for. This, to me, is the weirdest chapter and the one that demonstrates the most conclusively that Sanford is staggeringly misinformed about basic population genetic theory. And interestingly, the first chapter in which the newsflash doesn't give away the content. The chapter, A Closer Look at Noise, and the newsflash, The Problems Are Worse Than You Think. Uh-oh. This chapter is all about noise. He opens with his usual onslaught of analogies, all of which are trying to portray the concept that there is some amount of noise to biological systems, and that this noise hinders selection. He writes, quote, The reason that most nucleotides must be unselectable is because of consistently low signal-to-noise ratios. He goes on, Noise will consistently outweigh the effects of individual nucleotides in the big picture. He means two different things here, but treats them as a single thing. He starts off by introducing the concept of heritability. Simplistically, heritability is a measure of how much of the phenotypic variance in any trait that can be explained by genetics. It's important that we understand heritability in this way, and not, as Sanford writes, quote, heritability is simply the ratio of heritable versus non-heritable variation. To understand why we shouldn't view heritability like this, let's first note that heritability is calculated as h squared equals v sub g divided by v sub p, where h squared is what is called the broad sense heritability. We'll get to what that means in a moment. v sub g is the variance due to genetic variance, and v sub p is the total variance in the trait itself. This means, crucially, that for heritability to be measured at all, a trait must have variance. This is well illustrated by the example of five fingers. If we were to sample a million humans, virtually all of them would have five fingers. And those that don't typically lost a finger due to some accident. But there is no genetic variance 
for five fingers since everyone has them. Thus, all the variance is explained by the environment. So since that V of G term is equal to zero, that means that the heritability for five fingers is exactly zero. This is because none of the variance in the trait is explained by genes, despite the trait itself being completely genetically controlled. The important thing to remember about heritability is it's not about whether a trait is genetically controlled, only about the cause of the variation in that trait. The trait could be completely genetically controlled, but the variation could be caused completely by the environment. This is why Sanford is so wrong when he writes, quote, when heritability is one for a trait, that trait is 100% hereditary, and it is not affected by the environment at all. If heritability is zero for a trait, that trait is not inherited. It is entirely environmental in nature. Under Sanford's definition here, having five fingers is entirely environmental with no genetic component since its heritability is zero. Now remember before when I defined H squared as the broad sense heritability? Let's return to that for a second. Broad sense heritability includes all genetic effects, additive, dominant, and epistatic. Now usually these latter two are ignored for simplicity since they are harder to measure and breeders will often focus on what is called the narrow sense heritability, little h squared, which is simply the additive genetic component. This is easy to measure because each allele is contributing to the trait does so in a simple, predictable pattern across generations. According to Sanford, plant geneticist and retired Cornell professor, this is the only type of heritable variation. He writes, incredibly, and I quote, the only fraction of genetic variation that is heritable and therefore potentially selectable is what is called additive genetic variation. Let me repeat myself. Sanford believes that only additive genetic variation is heritable. Not dominance, not epistatic, only additive variation is heritable. I don't know if this is because he's never heard of broad sense heritability, or if he's trying some like sleight of hand on the audience that doesn't know better, but folks, this is stunningly incorrect. It's like me saying, well, brown eyes are dominant to blue eyes, so neither are part of the heritable variation because it's not additive. That's obviously a ridiculous thing to say. He amazingly continues on. He writes, quote, the heritability for a single trait, such as total fitness, can be remarkably small, yet the heritability of a typical nucleotide is infinitesimally smaller. My brother in Christ, nucleotides are always passed on from parent to offspring. They are the constituents of the heritable material. We measure the heritability of traits not of nucleotides. That's literally asking what's the heritability of DNA. He then contrasts what he calls probability selection with truncation selection. The latter is the idea that selection is acting within a certain phenotypic range. For example, if there's variance in a trait value between negative two and two, all individuals with a trait value of 1.5 or greater will reproduce. This kind of selection is often misunderstood among creationists, and, and Sanford leans into this by writing that Mother Nature doesn't line up individuals and pick from the top ones. Instead, organisms have some probability of reproducing or surviving, and this probability introduces noise. First, while truncation selection is useful in plant and animal breeding, no one thinks that selection in nature works in this way. James Crow in 1997 suggested that a better way to view this is a kind of quasi-truncation selection in which the probability of reproducing gradually increases across a range of phenotypic variances. This is quite intuitive, especially if we think of selection as competitive. Individuals are constantly interacting in a population, and if they possess a trait with a large amount of variance, some interactions will beat out others. Simplistically, let's say two organisms are going to fight over a food resource, and they do so by thumping their antlers together. There are three antler sizes, large, medium, and small. If medium antlers meet large antlers, the large antlers wins. If the medium meets the small, the medium wins. If medium meets medium, it's a coin toss who wins. 
And this way, traits are, again, context-dependent, and selection is only acting to weed out the lowest one, the small in this context, which only has an equivalent advantage of winning when it runs into small antlers. We could imagine something more complex, where instead of three discrete categories, we have a continuous range of fine gradation between each. We could also designate that above a certain range, no increased size grants an advantage. Perhaps there's a trade-off for growing antlers to a certain size. Hence, selection in nature can very much act in this kind of quasi-truncation selection. Now, truncation selection is not free of noise regardless, and this noise is different than how Sanford was using noise before. In this way, noise is whenever an individual reproduces and has variation less than the maximally fit. But this kind of noise is actually necessary for populations to persist. If we consider Haldane's cost, if only individuals with the best genotype reproduced, the population would just instantly collapse. Less fit individuals reproduce with lower probability than the more fit. That's just the basics of natural selection. Sanford's third level of noise he calls gametic sampling. He calls this simply, quote, the statistical variation associated with small population sizes. He goes on to write, classically, population geneticists have dealt with genetic noise only on the level of this last type of noise, gametic sampling, which is very sensitive to population size. Oh boy, it gets better. He writes, Kimura calculated the size of his no-selection box as a simple function of population size. It is very attractive for the genetic theorist to limit consideration of noise to just gametic sampling. This is because one can conveniently make noise from gametic sampling largely disappear by simply imagining larger populations, and gametic sampling is only a minor part of total genetic noise, and the other two important aspects of genetic noise are only partially diminished in large populations. How do I disentangle this web of confusion that Sanford has snared us in? Okay, first, the three kinds of noise he's invoking don't impact selection in the sort of additive way that he's imagining they do. First, heritability is not noise in the same way that genetic drift is noise. Heritability is simply how much of a trait that selection can act on at all. If heritability is, say, 0.3, then selection can move the trait mean by that amount. That has nothing to do with whether or not selection can see a mutation, nor does it have anything to do with genetic drift. The rest of the variance in the trait is environmental, which isn't relevant to evolution anyway. The second kind of noise has nothing to do with this one. It's about when individuals reproduce that don't have the best genotype. Again, this isn't noise in the interfering with selection sense. This is simply an expression of the selection coefficient itself. If selection increases the reproductive potential of an individual by 5%, that does not mean no one else in the population reproduces. It means that if you possess that trait, you'll have 5% more offspring than everyone else. If the population size stays constant, this increased probability will enable this trait to spread and eventually fix. Again, this does not interfere with selection. It's literally how it works. Only the last one, genetic drift, interferes with selection. But Sanford seems to think that somehow these other two sources of noise can somehow add to the box of what makes selection blind to certain mutations. This is nonsense. These concepts are not related to one another. Selection's efficiency is determined by genetic drift before there can be any probability selection, and before it acts on any phenotypic trait irrespective of its heritability. If the strength of selection exceeds that of drift, then it acts, and we can predict how it should act given its strength, that is its probability, if you will, and the heritability, which tells us how far it can push a trait. These latter two things only matter once selection has passed the threshold of drift in the first place, and hence only this last point matters at all. He also doesn't seem to understand that gametic sampling literally encompasses all chance-based events as it pertains to allele frequency variant, which, as we showed before, will determine how selection can act. 
This is fundamentally what the effective population size is capturing. Wrapped up in that single term is mating structure, age structure, random deaths, population structure, etc. This is because all of these things impact the rate at which allele frequencies fluctuate, which is what this term captures. Hence, Kimura's box cannot be widened. It is what it is. The effective population size is all we need to know to measure whether selection can be efficient. Sanford doesn't understand that effective size is not just the number of breeding individuals, but rather it captures any event that could be described as stochastic that is influencing allele frequencies. This is worth digging into more because I really want to drive this point home. Sanford goes on to write, quote, We cannot make noise go away by simply invoking larger population sizes. In fact, very large populations invariably have enhanced noise. This is due in part to population substructure, many smaller subpopulations, each with its own gametic sampling fluctuations. Sanford is dead wrong on this, and all he had to do was read a single paper by Sol Wright at any point in time since 1921, and he'd know why. Population structure actually increases the effect of population size, and indeed can make it larger than the census population size. To understand how this works, remember that the effective size is being measured here as the inverse of the rate of genetic drift, which is 1 on 2 in sub e. Imagine a population that is randomly mating of size 1000. The rate of drift in that population is 0 .0005, and the average time it will take for an allele to go to fixation is 4n generations, that is approximately 4000 generations. Now imagine you divide that population into subpopulations of 100 with very low levels of migration between each subpopulation, which we'll denote as M, such that each subpopulation receives 2 NM migrants per generation. If we assume that only one migrant is shared per generation, then M is equal to 0 0.001. Thus, we can estimate the effective population size as 2ND, where D is the number of subpopulations, multiplied by 1 plus 1 over 2M, where capital M is 2NMD divided by D minus 1. Plugging in our values, we get an effective population size of 65,000, which means that the rate of drift is 0 .000015, an order of magnitude smaller than what it was under random mating. How can this be? It's because subdivision actually slows the rate at which an allele can go to fixation. Not only does it have to increase in frequency within each subpopulation, we have to wait for a random migrant to carry that mutation to each one of the subpopulations. This means that the allele frequencies shift much slower every generation. Again, all of this is why it's so important to understand what is meant by the effective population size and how it represents the rate of genetic drift because it is ultimately genetic drift that is the only force that matters in whether selection will be efficient enough to purge deleterious variants. Sanford writes, quote, Kimura's no selection box must be expanded significantly based on the imperfect correlation between genotype and phenotype and based upon the imperfect correlation between phenotype and reproductive success. The result of these two imperfect correlations is that the number of near-neutral nucleotide positions is greater than commonly realized and their abundance is not strictly dependent on population size. So that we're perfectly clear. The efficiency of selection is determined by whether the variance and the frequency of a genetic variant each generation exceeds the selection coefficient acting on that variant. It does not matter if there is a perfect correlation between genotype and phenotype. Selection acts on whatever correlation exists. This is the fundamental principle of quantitative genetics. For any trait in which selection is acting that has many loci contributing to this trait, selection will act on the cumulative genetic variance, not merely on the additive variance, as Sanford states. And even if only a tiny portion of the variance in that phenotype is due to genetics, selection will act on that phenotype 
regardless, because the phenotype is what it sees. If there are genes underlying it, then they will increase in frequency. If there are no genes underlying it, then you still have natural selection, you just don't have evolution by natural selection. The first six chapters represents the crux of Sanford's argument. The following four chapters read as a kind of response to the critic's afterthought. He discusses James Crow's concept of quasi-truncation uh, in Chapter 7, Crow to the Rescue, which we've already talked about, um, how eugenics and modern medicine can't save us in Chapter 8, Man to the Rescue, a wildly out-of-place Chapter 9, Can Natural Selection Create?, uh, in which he argues that selection cannot actually make anything new, as well as a good old waiting time problem making a cameo appearance, both of which are irrelevant to whether or not we're going to go extinct due to genomic deterioration. And then the final chapter 10, Is the Downward Curve Real? Uh, which gives us loads more nonsensical analogies, but provides literally no data on human population decline outside of citing James Crow out of context and then plotting the ages of Noah's children through time. None of these chapters present anything additional to the argument, so I'll spare you deep dives into them. But before wrapping up, let's address the final point standing from Sanford, that effectively neutral mutations can accumulate and lead to genetic deterioration. We've already shown why the mutation load argument doesn't work due to overly simplistic assumptions, and that his other sources of noise are not noise in the sense that they hinder selection. They are only noise in the sense of the relationship between genotype and phenotype. Again, selection can still act on a phenotype even if there's no genetic basis at all. It just won't lead to evolution. We've also showed that the deleterious mutation rate is not unexpected, and that for a population to maintain equilibrium, the deleterious rate must exceed the beneficial. With our previous discussion of effective neutrality and effective population size, we should be equipped to address the last gasp of this concept of genetic entropy, the accumulation of effectively neutral, though strictly speaking deleterious, mutations. For this argument, I'm going to grant every one of Sanford's assumptions. Multiplicative fitness, no synergistic epistasis, no beneficial mutations, and 100% genome functionality. As we showed before, the selection coefficient necessary in humans to be effectively neutral is 7.1 e to the negative 11, because the variance effective size in humans is likely close to 7 billion. The human genome size is around 3 billion base pairs long, so let's consider the condition in which every single one of those base pairs are substituted to a less fit, effectively neutral variant. If we consider each mutation as contributing multiplicatively to fitness, then we can write fitness as 1 minus s raised to the g, where s is the selection coefficient and g is the genome size. The 1 minus s term is just the fitness cost of an individual mutation. Plugging in the numbers, we see that the fitness cost, given that s is equal to 7.1 e to the negative 11 and g is equal to 3 e to the 9, is 0.81. That is, around 19% of the population fails to reproduce due to the genetic load. Is this a tolerable load? The number of offspring an individual family would need to have to tolerate this is 1 over 1 minus 0.19, which is equal to 1.2, which, multiplied by 2 since we're diploids, is 2.4. Let me repeat that. If every single nucleotide in the genome was substituted to a less fit effectively neutral variant, each family would only need to have, on average, 2.4 children for the population to persist. Again, that's assuming no beneficial mutations, no selection at all, and still the human population would persist. This is because the variance effective size of humans is presently so large that for an allele to be effectively neutral, the selection coefficient would need to be so small that its value would be less than the inverse of the genome size. Whenever the selection coefficient is less than the inverse of the genome size, then no amount of mutation accumulation will cause the population harm. And that's exactly what Alexei Kondrashov found in his famous 1995 paper in which he asks, why have we not died a hundred times over that creationists love to cite but never read? 
If they had taken the time to actually dig into the math, they would have found that he clearly shows that if 1 over g is greater than s, then there is no danger from the accumulation of effectively neutral mutations. Genetic entropy has failed at every front. It is neither a challenge to evolution or an interesting scientific hypothesis. It presents nothing novel. It represents a combination of hodgepodge ideas that are unconnected, ignorance as to the basic mechanisms of population genetics, including ideas like heritability and effective population size. And worst of all, it lacks the conviction to actually set any of its predictions to the test, to lay down the mathematics that would demonstrate whether or not the idea holds weight. In chapter 10, we finally get the term genetic entropy, which Sanford understands as the combination of mutational entropy, mutations are always degrading things, coupled with selection and efficiency. He writes, quote, if the genome must degenerate, then the primary axiom is wrong. The primary axiom is certainly wrong. It's wrong and that it's a straw man. And genetic entropy is perhaps the most tinfoil hat creationist idea I've yet encountered. I've thought a lot about how to conclude this book review, what sort of final thoughts I'd like to give. Um, this is the first creationist book I've read cover to cover since I was a teenager, and I must admit to being sorrowfully disappointed in it. Um, this book was hailed to me as this incredible piece of work that fundamentally challenged evolutionary theory. And I feel pretty cheated. It's just a bad movie that got overhyped. One last laugh I got from the book was in the first appendix titled, A Deeply Entrenched Ideology. He opens it with a quote, It is obvious that the omnipotent power of natural selection can do all things, explain all things. But when it comes to the quote's attribution, he writes, The above statement came from an early Darwinist, but I have lost the source. And I feel like this perfectly captures the level of scholarship in this book. It is a shoddy piece of writing, laced with profoundly ignorant statements, confused logic, and frankly offensive claims about the honesty and integrity of population geneticists like myself. More offensive than this, though, is the fact that Sanford doesn't even take me seriously. And I mean me as in the scientific community. He doesn't even pretend that I'm going to read his book. And so I've ultimately wasted my time in doing so, and perhaps yours in watching this. He doesn't try to represent evolutionary theory sincerely because he doesn't care if any evolutionary biologist ever reads it. I wish I could say that the writing was at least stylistic and interesting. I wish I could say that at least it was well cited so that you could dig into the claims more deeply yourself. I wish I could say it was clearly peer-reviewed and received thorough editing, and that I had to genuinely think about the claims, that, and, and that perhaps I learned something new. I wish I could say those things. But this book respects neither the science it critiques, or the reader who it attempts to befuddle. Whether this latter fact is a product of cleverness on the part of John Sanford, or simply a reflection of the author's own foolishness, I cannot say. But I have my opinions. Thanks so much for being here and slogging through this beast with me. Hopefully you learned a little pop gin along the way and are at least well armed to challenge anyone who would assert that Sanford's book is some definitive rebuttal of evolutionary theory. If you like what I do here, drop me a comment, hit like and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time.